Hey, what's up, guys? Richard here, back with another episode of our Cosmic I Ching series. We're going through all 64 hexagrams of this uh, new version of the I Ching. It's called I Ching Oracle, the Cosmic Way. I just call it the Cosmic I Ching because uh, that's shorter. <laughs> um, and uh, here we're on hexagram 45 today, which is uh, maybe some of you know is my actually my personality sun uh, gate in uh, cosmic human design. So this is kind of my essence right here that we're looking at. Um, so maybe I'll be able to give you guys some more in-depth commentary on this one. Um, 45, gathering together, uh, which I can't help but mention outside my house right now is this mat that says gather here. <laughs> and then I looked at that and I saw the 45. I'm like, what is happening? Yeah, so, and if you're into the cosmic human design stuff, you guys will be able to, I guarantee you, you will see all these things in your daily life uh, reflected that, that are here in these hexagrams. It's really incredible. It's really synchronistic. Gathering together, uh, lake over the earth, the judgment, gathering together, success. The king approaches his temple. It furthers one to see the great man. This brings success. Perseverance furthers. To bring great offerings creates good fortune. It furthers one to undertake something. This hexagram is about the workings of e ego logic compared to cosmic logic. Wow. The logic of the collective ego diverts the individual from looking at the primary premises and assumptions on which its whole existence is based. All the lines have to do with this diversion, the goal of which is to gather more and more followers around the collective ego's goals. The circular logic of the collective ego is shown here in the image of a king who, after having deified his ancestor, subsequently uses the ancestor to legitimize himself as his designated heir and ruler, the son of heaven. The building in which the dead ancestor is kept is made sacred, as indicated by the word temple. A ritual surrounds the ceremony of his legitimation with mystery, and a taboo is placed against question, questioning how the ritual or game has come into being. These measures ensure that no one shall question how the collective ego works or realize how it supports itself. The second part of the judgment defines how the people are to relate to the king, to see him as the great man. Furthering means seeing him as great is necessary if you want to have success within the system. Perseverance furthers means that success is to be attained through dedicated subservience. Remember, this is the collective ego viewpoint of the hexagram. Great offerings and the shouldering of societal duties. These societal duties are embodied in loyalty to the collective ego and its values. In the cosmic logic, however, it is the sage that approaches humankind. It approaches each individual uniquely in relation to where the person is in his development. It never speaks to people as the masses. Instead of collecting the masses around a belief that puts a human leader in the center, the sage helps each person to see and realize his own inner truth. Instead of requiring great offerings, as in sacrificing one's true nature, his individuality, and energy, effort, and money, um, to the collective ego, the sage, help, sage helps a person free his true nature from the small programmatic phrases by which he is held in the collective ego's service. Instead of gathering people together around an ideal, the sage gathers people around their inner truth. Instead of loyalty to an institution, the sage supports the individual's loyalty to his inner truth. Instead of forming closed social circles defined by beliefs, the sage shows that the forms of association need to be free to allow for transformations as the evolution of the whole requires. Gathering together in its cosmic meaning defines what is needed to allow the natural order of society to emerge within a group. By calling in advance of the meeting on the sage, the cosmic meaning of the great man that exists in the presence of every person, including oneself, to intervene to restrain the ego in those present. This brings great success. Perseverance furthers refers to keeping firm and correct and saying the inner no anytime the ego shows itself in the situation. If furthers want to undertake something, it's counsel to maintain contact with one's inner truth by not allowing oneself to be diverted by any temptations put forward by the ego that would destroy the natural unity and harmony of the group. Gathering together also concerns what rallies the wheels of individuals to cooperate. 
What is it that they gather around? Their wheels can be truly rallied around the inner truth that resonates in each person individually. All appeals to the interests of a group for its own sake are short-lived and must be continually propped up through instilling fear or guilt, building up anger, or appealing to vanity as through flattery. In schooling, for example, the will to learn is natural. It is stimulated when what is being taught resonates with the student's inner truth and adds genuinely to broadening his perception and understanding. The teaching of dogma, knowledge which is divorced from a feeling awareness of life, and the rote memorization of unrelated data stifle the will to learn, turning bright students into dullards. <laughs> Spells that damage the will to cooperate are, for example, every group must have a leader, otherwise chaos rules. Groups are a study of egos. Everybody is out for his own interest. Not everybody has the potential for greatness. They do. Only the family, nation, etc., can give you protection. They can't. And these commentary lines from the image traditionally associated with this hexagram, such as the superior man renews his weapons in order to meet the unforeseen. Where men gather together in numbers, strife is likely to arise. Where possessions are gathered together, robbery is likely to occur. While most of the above mentioned phrases are true for groups dominated by the collective ego, when generalized, they put spells of mistrust on the social order that make it impossible for the natural order to emerge. Here we go with the spells again, and you know, these words and phrases, keep in mind the words and phrases. That's the key, because we don't commonly realize that words have this power, but they do, they do. <clears throat> but we can say no to them. If we realize what's going on, we have to realize what's going on, that's the point. Uh, and then we can say no to it you know, to that spell, to that phrase, to those words. <clears throat> and humans, we have the unique gift of language. That's the human's unique gift is the ability to use language. That doesn't make us special or the center of the universe or anything like that. But, um, you know, it does make it our responsibility to clean up the language we've been using, which can put spells on nature, on the cosmos, on ourselves. And you know, prevent the development of, of our true selves, keep us locked in prisons. <clears throat> Line one, there will sometimes be confusion, sometimes gathering together. This line points to a situation in which a person in a position of leading others and who is normally held in their confidence is uncertain within himself and therefore causes them to be uncertain of him and to resist his direction. He has relied on his inner feelings to make his decisions, but since they do not fit precisely within the framework of what the collective ego defines as right or wrong, he has doubted himself. To rectify the situation, he needs only to disperse the doubt to which they are reacting. If he will take no measures to convince them, which would only reflect that he still doubts, their confidence will be restored. If after reflection he is still doubtful, he needs to consult the sage to identify and rid himself of his cause. It will be counterproductive if his uncertainty causes him to conform to what the collective ego would say he should do. There will sometimes be confusion, sometimes gathering together, also points to a person whose wholeness has been split into parts by his adopting the idea that he has a higher and a lower nature. This gives his body and psyche unclear messages as to which part is in charge of his personality, leading to inner conflict and in turn to illness. The ego then proposes that the solution to the problem is to integrate these parts, to make them function again. This cannot succeed, however, because the dividing of his wholeness has put a spell on both his psyche and his body. His return to wholeness requires that he free himself of the spell caused by the idea that he is divided into parts to begin with. That's the spell. We are not divided into parts. This line also draws attention to the confusion a person falls into when he fails to question the fundamental premises or presumptions on which a belief is based. If the first premise is a half-truth, a statement based on external perception only, he needs to examine its hidden implications and ask the sage to help free him from its negative influence. Line two, letting oneself be drawn brings good fortune and remains blameless. If one is sincere, it furthers one to bring even a small offering. Letting oneself be drawn refers to allowing the correct way to show itself by responding only. 
rather than taking the initiative by responding to what our innocences tell us in relation to the situation of the moment, we remain blameless. In this circumstance, we restrict ourselves to saying only what we feel is correct for us. We never tell others what they should do or how they should feel. Thus, we do not lose our cosmic protection. Letting oneself be drawn informs us that by holding to our integrity, regardless of what others say, the help we need will come as we need it, since the cosmos freely helps every person who is sincere in his way of life. Wow. The small offering is the relinquishing of pride, which will enable a person to receive help from the cosmos. Pride prevents him from accepting help from the sage and even from other people. A prideful person may believe that his freedom lies in being totally independent of help, or he may refuse help through fear of obligation or be embarrassed for needing help. But true independence comes from recognizing one's interdependence with all things and one's partnership with the sage and the helpers. This line can also refer to someone who is recruiting people to fight and if necessary to die for a cause. He draws them by pointing to dangers and evils that threaten from without and by offering recognition and honor in exchange for obedience, risk, and service. He also relies on the musts and shoulds of the collective ego to remind them of their duty to serve. The true danger for the individual comes from failing to say the inner no to these musts and shoulds because they prevent him from following his own inner truth. The collective ego advises people to rely on concretized beliefs as their source of spiritual nourishment. However, when a person follows a concretized belief, he is drawn into dangers by the fact that they shut off his ability to listen to his inner senses and feelings. Moreover, the true nourishment he longs for is not to be found in belief, but only in his contact with his feelings. Nourishment cannot be drawn from a spirit that has been defined as being in opposition to the body and its feelings, which is what, for example, the splitting of a person to mind, body, and spirit does. <clears throat> this line calls attention to concretized beliefs to which people have been drawn in large numbers, simply because they have been pronounced to be the great truths of life. In reality, they have put spells on life that project the beliefs into reality for those who believe in them. An example is the belief that life is suffering. In order to be true, the phrase would need to read, life is suffering if, because suffering is always conditional and dependent on a person's relationship with the cosmos. Similar beliefs are, the only rewards are in the afterlife. Life is a veil of tears. Life is an illusion. <laughs> life is a script written by you. The end of life is death. Life sucks and then you die. And life is what happens while you're busy making other plans. <laughs> oh God, I hate those phrases. Ugh, terrible. <laughs> Line three, gathering together amid sighs, nothing that would further. Going is without blame, slight humiliation. Gathering amid sides can refer to a person in need who sees himself without help of any kind and is therefore unable to gather to his aid the cosmic helpers. Or it refers to a person who would like to rely on the sage, but his self-image of being a skeptic prevents him. In such situations, nothing furthers. Going is without blame is counsel that such a person needs to reject his faulty idea or self-image. Doing so will release the block he has put on his common sense. Common sense is capable all by itself of knowing how to draw help, when to be skeptical, and when not. And, you know, it seems like, you know, the last thing people want to give up is their ideas. You know, even if they're so obviously false, they want to cling to these ideas, you know. Um, <laughs> but you got to see through, see through the spell. You got to break the spell. Such a person in need is caught in the trap of believing only in what he sees. This makes life a burden, causing him to sigh as he says to himself, there's no one to help me. I've got to do it all myself. Another person may hold the belief that he should only trust what can be seen. Behind this, this belief is the image of the invisible world as unknown and unknowable. He therefore unreasonably fears and distrusts it and would not think of asking it for help. Disbelief in what is invisible also separates a person from his invisible inner senses and feelings, such as his inner senses of smell, taste, and touch, that together with his metaphorical senses would bring him immeasurable health 
and will connect him with aspects of the cosmos that can only be felt. The size indicated in this line often refer to superficial explanations of life that are fundamentally unsatisfactory, both because they exhaust the person's life force and because they keep him from gathering the help he needs from cosmic sources. Some of these explanations come from religion, some from philosophy, some from science, because uh, in particular, those beliefs that give only half an explanation of reality. Um, because they only recognize what is seen with the outer eyes and therefore deny the existence of the invisible helpers. All their accounts of the paranormal are put into the category of the unexplainable or supernatural and therefore out of reach for the person who in reality desperately needs to draw cosmic helpers. <clears throat> Another, other explanations attempt to laugh away all evidence that the invisible reality exists. Still others seek to, seek to understand in ways that exclude the feelings, as when they think of conquering or engineering the unknown. The cosmic reality can only be accessed within, through a person's combined inner senses, and through humbling himself to ask that unknown to reveal itself to them. People who live only in the parallel reality see hope as the one thing that keeps them going on through life. They say, without hope, there is nothing. This hope is coupled with size because it is a coin whose backside is hopelessness. Such a person hopes for better times and comforts himself with the belief that life is governed by changes with bad times followed by good times. When the good times do not appear, however, hopelessness sets in and the person then concludes that life is nothing but suffering. All these beliefs only perpetuate themselves and prevent the person from gathering to himself the help of the cosmos. The world does not operate on changes, it's transformations. Both unfulfilled hope and hopelessness make a person look for someone or something to blame. The collective ego puts the blame on the fact that life takes place on the earth rather than in heaven. It is a dreary experience, hard, a veil of tears, a struggle for survival, a jungle, an experience that is not for the timid, etc. Going is without blame counsels the person to say the final inner no to such ideas that slander life, the earth, and the nature of the cosmos. He also needs to rid himself of the spells created by these basic half-truths, half-truths. A person who does not allow for the invisible world also does not allow for his true feelings, wow, which connect him with the loving nature of the cosmos. Wow, there you go, in one sentence right there, sums it up. A person who does not allow for the invisible world to exist or be there does not allow for his true feelings, and he's out of touch with his true self. This line can also refer to a person who has started to learn from the sage, but has come either to the conclusion that the ego cannot be gotten rid of, or that the efforts needed to free his true self are too hard, or if achieved might upset his relationships. Such ideas make him sigh, returning him to the fold of the collective ego. Among such phrases are, you need your ego to cope with life. No, you don't. <laughs> Sometimes it hurts, it hurts your ability to cope with life, actually. Sometimes I really like my ego. You can never get completely rid of your ego. You are born without help. This kind of learning is too hard. You have to learn through hard experience or it isn't worthwhile. None of those things are true. Gathering amid size can also refer to the person who joins those who are suffering by practicing compassion with them. In this case, nothing furthers because his belief fails to recognize that he is trying to take the place of the helpers rather than calling them into action. Thus, he only perpetuates the suffering. Wow. Wow. <clears throat> Moreover, when a person practices compassion toward another who is suffering a fate, his acts may inhibit the others making an effort to search for the elements in himself that are the cause of his suffering. Compassion in this case represents an act of magnificence on the part of the person who practices it and creates a fate for him. Getting rid of the self-image of being compassionate prevents the person from getting drawn time again into those fates of others. It also frees him to give help to others in direct response to their need. Such help is given spontaneously from the feeling of the moment and without forethought. Indeed, during such times, a person is motivated by the helpers. This kind of action does not create a fate. Line four, great good fortune, no blame. Oh, isn't that nice? 
great good fortune refers to gathering together all the cosmic helpers to come to a person's help. This is done through saying the inner no to what is incorrect in the situation and calling on a sage in everyone's presence to intervene. Receiving this line may be affirming that a person is sincere in his way of life and therefore gathers the blessings of the cosmos. Great good fortune also refers to times when the natural order of society arises as each person follows his inner truth. When this is the case, each individual, each individual recognizes and validates the true selves of other people, ending all envy, jealousy, feeling of inferiority, striving for position, hierarchical domination, and the need for force and external control. Then also, no new spells coming from such ego emotions are put on people. This natural order of society begins with the individual's consistency in divesting himself of the ego in himself. He also does not fail to say the inner no whenever the egos and others are active, or to ask for the sage in their presence to intervene. When this practice becomes widespread, all spells that create disorder in a group become deactivated, removing all need for controls to be imposed from without. Because every person's equality and uniqueness is recognized and validated, there is happiness. By contrast, great good fortune as defined by the collective ego in the context of gathering together only occurs when the collective ego's controls or rewards are sufficient to keep its order in place. Great good fortune can also refer to a promise given by a human leader that if someone will follow his beliefs, he will receive the blessings of the cosmos. In this case, the line is a warning that following another's beliefs creates a fate. This line can also be warning a person against relying on someone who considers himself a sage and interprets the I Ching for others. The sage does not give tasks to people who give themselves the air of master, sage, etc. The person can rely on the RTCM to inform him whether someone who has experience with the I Ching can help him understand it. The true guide will discourage any dependence on himself and encourage those he helps to learn how to communicate directly with the sage that speaks through the I Ching. A person who seeks out or follows people who give themselves the titles of masters often labor under spells to put his own common sense down, such as you can't trust your senses feelings. What the leaders say is true because you can see it, calling attention to half-truths that are based on what is seen only. Other spells that keep a person from communicating directly with the sage may have to do with fears of punishment or feelings of guilt that arise when he questions his established beliefs. These spells make him adopt the comfortable approach, as in, my guru tells me what to do. I don't have to worry about making mistakes. <laughs> Real right. <clears throat> line five, which by the way, I'm the 45.5, so this is like kind of my line right here. If in gathering together, one has position, this brings no blame. If there are some who are not yet sincerely following their inner truth, being firm in what is correct is needed then remorse disappears. Through making continuous efforts in ridding himself of mistaken ideas and beliefs, and thereby uncovering his true self, the person automatically finds himself a sinner for gathering others around him, whose true natures have been suppressed. There is a danger that they might want to follow him because they have been taught to follow an authority. In this case, they are not yet sincere in following their inner truth. Firm and correct refers to their learning to say the inner no to any dependence on human authority, Otherwise, there'll be remorse. There will also be remorse for the person who gathers others around him if he grandiosely concludes from this that it is his destiny to be a leader. It is a cosmic principle that a person may not allow the ego to usurp and use the confidence of those who gather around him. When the ego becomes involved, there's the danger that he puts spells and poison arrows on the people around him to the effect that they est establish him as their leader and they look up to him for recognition and authorization. In this way, what could be a group with a natural order is turned into a group that takes on the hierarchical structure of the collective ego's order. When this happens, the sage uses the mistake to teach everyone in the situation the consequences of violating the cosmic principles of equality, uniqueness, and loyalty to one's inner truth. The person receiving this line may be experiencing those consequences in the form of fate. In this case, he is informed that that he can free himself of his fate by ridding himself of the mistaken ideas listed below. This line also refers to how the collective ego appropriates, appropriates gathers a person's cosmic virtues and the virtues intrinsic to his nature 
and puts them up as virtues that people need to acquire under its tutelage. The collective ego then turns these virtues into more requirements that are used by it to suppress the person's true nature. Thus, loyalty, for example, which in cosmic terms means being loyal to one's inner truth, is turned into loyalty to the collective ego's institutions, regardless of what the person's inner truth tells them. Some seed phrases in connection with this line spell out values of the collective ego, which place a person in conflict with his inner truth, such as a good citizen is also a patriot. My country, right or wrong, there must be a head of the family ship nation if there is to be order. Someone needs to be in command. Every hen house needs a rooster. You must have goals to get ahead in life. The goals being those of the collective ego, of course, or order needs to be implemented. These phrases show that the collective ego's order is hierarchical, made up of rules which are imposed either blindly or factionally, and so are the source of repetitive fates. Only when the seed phrases that justify such structures and rules are taken away and the people's true natures are freed, can the natural order, which is a feeling order, emerge. The natural order exists whenever these conditions occur. The natural order of society can also be called the symbiotic order because it is based on the individual's unity with the cosmos. When each person brings himself into harmony with the cosmos, the order that results for the group is also in accord with the cosmos. Wow. And you know, I think that's really what cosmic human design does. It helps you um, find and discover your own inner truth and uh, bring yourself into harmony with the cosmos. Um, and as such, you can see in this line, you know, what, uh, what a great future possibly there is for cosmic human design and that, um, you know, this is really a way in which the natural order of society can emerge, <laughs> um, you know, uh, and I think that's just incredible. You know, I'd love that for that to happen. Um, you know, everyone following their own inner truth. That's what we want. That's what everyone uh, should want. You know, that's what the cosmos wants. That's, that's that I think, part of the cosmic plan, absolutely, is to have, uh, you know, a way for people to, um, you know, find their own inner truth uh, easily, accessibly, follow it, um, you know, with the help of the sage, the helpers of the invisible world. Um, line six, lamenting and sighing, floods of tears, no blame. This line refers to a person who is despairing because he's been on the path of someone else's truth and has come to its inevitable dead end. He was meant to follow his own unique path with his inner truth as a guide. He entered this path when he accepted the idea and the spell it put on his inner truth that his feelings cannot be trusted and that he therefore needed to follow someone who knows the truth. Having now come to the dead end, he may seek refuge in the belief that his only hope lies in the afterlife. This thought gives his body and his will the message that it needs to die. With the will to live given up, all the chi energy leaves the body, causing an illness that will lead to that goal. Consciously or subconsciously, giving the body such messages is the cause of most cancer. Even flirting with such ideas causes illness that can lead to death. Wow. This line spells out the cosmic principle that every life has a purpose and that to question why, is he, why he is alive or to doubt the fundamental purpose of his life creates a faith. Doing so is a luxurious attitude that comes from the human-centered view of the cosmos. Just as the natural social order described in line five is, is a symbiotic one, health is also an unimpeded symbiosis among all aspects of a person, in particular between his psyche and his body. Thus in the brain, for example, there is no natural dominance of the forebrain over the rest of the brain nor is there superiority of thinking or feeling. When one part dominates another, an imbalance is created that causes susceptibility to illness. Wow, just incredible stuff we're learning here. Guys, um, I hope you can see how incredible this knowledge is. And especially in its application we saw in this hexagram, the potential to create the natural order of society, the just society. Uh, where everyone is following their own inner truth and there's no ego emotions, where everyone is happy, everyone's expressing their uniqueness, which is the purpose of your life, to express your own uniqueness. 
that's the whole purpose of your life, your destiny. You know, um, the ego, it tries to constantly, constantly keep us away from it. Um, because the, the ego, you know, it's this program, it's this program, that's what it's supposed to do. It keeps you chained to the collective ego and these structures of belief and thoughts and spells and words, um, you know, they have a real effect, absolutely tangible effect on your life. <laughs> Um, and that's one thing as a whole we need to do is get back in touch with the invisible reality. Um, you know, just because we can't see it doesn't mean it doesn't exist. Absolutely not. It's the world of consciousness. You can't see your own consciousness, can you? No, no. So, you know, disbelieving in the invisible reality is like disbelieving in your own consciousness, in yourself, which, of course, is exactly what the collective ego wants. You know, we need to be aware that there is this force out there that is actively trying to keep us away from our own inner truth, from what is really good for us. Um, and that's something that people have a hard time believing, or maybe it upsets them, or maybe they get scared. But, you know, um, that's just how it is. And it's not, uh, you know, and, you know, like, uh, maybe the entire purpose of that is to help us, you know, get back to our own inner truth we can look at it that way we can look at all the bad things in the world all the ego things because they are all ego things every bad thing that happens is caused by the ego um you know we have to look at that as giving us a motivation to finding our own inner truth you know all right guys thanks so much for watching uh, don't forget to like and subscribe right there and i'll see you again in the next one